And Lisa going first. Yes, I'm going first. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa. Um, I'm just here mostly because I wanted to point out to everybody um, when people reach out for help, um, usually if it's their initial diagnosis, most people are freaked out. And when they're reaching out for help, they just want to be able to talk to someone and ask a gazillion questions and get answers to every question they ever had about C. diff, and they want you to provide that information. Um, I want to express it's really, really important to not give medical, ad medical advice unless you have a degree. If you have a degree to back your advice, then feel free to give all the medical advice you want. But the big thing people try to get out of you that I have found in the groups that I moderate is that they want to go to you and they want you to diagnose them. And that's not an advocate's job. It's not our job to, to diagnose. It's our job to help them along. Um, CEDA doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what gender you are. It doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care what your economical status is. Um, CEDA brings people together, whether we like it or not. Um, my experience as a moderator, I started out as a CEDA member, just like you know, the other people that are in this group as, as a CEDA patient. Um, I kind of got put into the position of a moderator because I didn't actually start the Facebook group that I moderate, I was appointed to it. One day I went on there and I was able to approve people and I thought, wait a minute, now I'm approving people. Wait, now they're posting and I'm approving their post. Something happened here, there's gonna change. <laughs> so I didn't get any response. I'm like, okay, everybody, apparently I'm a moderator now and it just kind of snowballed. And finally the guy that actually started the page or the forum sent me a message, he said, I'm sorry, I should have asked you first, and, and if you didn't want to do it, I'll close it down, because he's one of those. He started the group because he felt like crap, and then he felt better and he left the group. And that's what happens a lot. So the, the important thing is, is, for those of us that are sick, or continue to be sick, or have only been sick once, and I'm, caregivers are important too, but if you're a patient, please hang around, because other patients are looking for people to give them advice and help and support. And if all of us get better and run off, then it's just a bunch of sick people trying to help a bunch of sick people. And that, you know, I don't know about anybody else that's had CETA, but anytime I've been really sick in it, my brain is gone. So I, you know, even when you're really sick, it's hard to do that. So that's how I even got started in this. Um, so I moderate that group. I also started um, a pictorial called The Faces of CETA, which is a pictorial tribute to see the patients um, that are here and those that have passed. And it's really just for a picture and a brief bit of their story so people can go to that group, it's an open group, um, and they can look and they can read and they can put a face to the disease because it's not just all elderly people, it's across the board. Um, I also, um, other than moderating those two groups, I also started the people of FMT failure group. Not that I'm against fecal transplants at all. I want to say that because people have taken us the wrong way. I didn't even start the group because I had one, because I have not. I started the group because since I'm a moderator of a CDIP group, I've had lots of people reach out to me and say, Lisa, it didn't work for me. I'm not comfortable trying to talk with these people because some of them felt like they were attacked in other groups. Whether that's the case or not, it's all perspective from the patient, and that's what's important. So that's why I started the group, because it's important for people that don't succeed in one area, they can try another. Um, and honestly, there's not a one size fits all cure. I know everybody wants there to be one, but there's not. Because genetically and microbiome wise, we are all individually and unique. There's, not, there's no two alike. So to think we're ever gonna really master this is one thing. Let's try to prevent it. Let's stop the antibiotics. Let's stop all of that. So um, when you're supporting other people, it's just really important to focus on those kind of things of um, give them compassion. When people are reaching out and wanting support, that's what they're really wanting is just compassion and, and someone to lean on. Um, when you're working as an advocate, you don't want to be inappropriate. You don't want to cross any lines of inappropriateness. If you are, like my experience is on Facebook, I spend probably eight hours a day on there, not in a row, but going on and checking and moderating and that. Um, don't ever be inappropriate. It, even if you feel a fondness towards a person or think they're pretty or cute or whatever, don't make comments on pictures. Don't, don't step over that line because then that takes away the trust that you're building as an advocate. 
you're there to help them through an illness or through a rough time, not to build a relationship. If you want that, then don't do it on an advocacy level. Just do it on a, hey, I want a dating level. Um, <laughs> true story. Um, already said don't diagnose. I mean, that's the big one. Um, how to be our own advocate and to help others. Um, a big thing I do is I send people to other websites. Um, I direct them, of course, to the Peggy Lillis Foundation website, so they can go there. Um, there's also another one called cdiscuss.org. Um, I sometimes send people there, but I found that one a little confusing because you, it's not real time, you can't talk to people. And I found on Facebook groups, people like immediate response. If it takes me a half hour to respond to somebody, they're already typing something up, then, you know, and I have to remind them, I'm going to classes full time, I'm doing other things, so give me a minute to, to answer you. Um, there's also um, several Facebook groups, other than my own, which is CETA support, um, Faces of CETA. There's also um, the FMT failures. There's the Beagle Transplant Foundation, that's run by Catherine. I send a lot of people over that way. And there's also um, the uh, FMT discussion group, which is run by Tracy, um, which is another good one. They've discussed all kinds of stuff. I think that if, if everybody just kind of focuses on the individuals that you're dealing with, you'll find out what their needs are. And if you come to a point when you don't think that you know what they're asking, or you don't really know how to direct them, then find someone else in the advocacy group or someone else that knows that maybe you can direct them to. Um, if you find a common bond, if someone says, hey, listen, I had this terrible burning pain in the middle of my abdomen, and the doctors are saying it's not C. diff, I've had that every time I've had C. diff. So if you're having it and you're diagnosed positive and you've had that every time you've had C. diff, it's probably C. diff for you too. Um, so it's one of those things, find a common ground that you can, you know, share with somebody and, and open up to them because then that puts them on a personal level that they're more apt to be able to, you know, go, all right, I feel comfortable talking to this person, I'm going to talk to them. Um, just share your experiences. And that's the big thing. My main thing when I started out in 2007, there, were, there weren't Facebook groups. There wasn't, there wasn't resources for me to go to. and talk to other people. I mean, I met really cool people from this. So I think that the resources are out there. And as you go along, join the groups. I, I recommend, I've recommended to every doctor I've ever seen to go join these groups. And there's other C. diff groups too, not just mine. So just put C. diff up in the Facebook search bar and you'll find them. Um, but I've told every medical professional I've come into, just join the group and watch. Just sit in the back like an eagle and watch what is said by real patients in real time that aren't intimidated by your white coat, that are talking freely amongst each other about poop. They don't even want to talk about poop at the doctor's office. So I'll tell every one of you, if you really want to help people get through this, there is no such thing as too much information when you'll see them. Not from my perspective as a patient. I didn't ever want to hear someone go, oh, that's too much information. Well, then how am I supposed to know if it's normal? If I can't ask you if it's normal because it's too much information. No, there's no such thing as too much information, in my opinion, when dealing with this illness from a patient's perspective. Now, maybe from someone that's not dealt with it or, you know, whatever, it might be a little wiggy, but, you know, when I said earlier today about destigmatizing poop, it's really what it comes down to. And as an advocate, I think that's where I've been able to open up to people because I'm real. I can take, I understand medical jargon. I can read the peer-reviewed journals and I understand what they say. So I can take that information and I can put it into layman's speech. You know, you have C. diff bacteria that turn into spores and they, they put all the bad guys out. Well, I turn that into, you have a playground. You have all the good kids on the playground. If the playground is full of good kids and a bully shows up, chances are the bully is not going to stay around. However, if all the good kids are getting pushed off of the swings and knocked out of the playground by the bullies and then five more bullies come up, you can see how it happens. Same thing with C. diff. It's not really any different. So the trick is, is finding terms, finding a language that other patients, other caregivers, other people can relate to and can understand, whether it's you're dealing with a patient or whether you're dealing with a caregiver. I can say I have been a patient myself for nine years, and my mother last year had C. diff. She recurred three times. Now, me having dealt with it for nine years, I can deal with it. I can get over that. But I've also seen the aspect of a caregiver. 
watching my mother on a toilet 30 times in a row, but. So always know to find when you're talking with people, know that what they're dealing with is their reality, it's their passion and it's their heart because it's their loved one. So we can't ever lessen it. It's not a game to see who's more sick or who's got the worst this or who's got the worst that. When someone reaches out to you, just accept them in, listen to what they have to say and see if you can help. If you can't help, then find out who can. And that's the, I mean, that's really the best thing that I've got to say is just direct people into the way they need to go. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on, which is really big, is disinfection. And I'm touching on that just because most people that I've talked to have no idea how to properly disinfect. Now, mind you, you can go to a gazillion links of germicidals and disinfectants and find the information. So the big thing is, is just make sure you, you profess people to do proper hand washing. Wash your hands after you use the bathroom. Wash your hands before you eat. Because even if the person next to you has C. diff and you've washed your hands and not taken antibiotics and you've done your best course, then you're more likely to prevent C. diff from happening because you won't get the fecal to mouth transmission. So um, that's the biggie. So do all your research on your, on your um, disinfection. Come to my um, Facebook group. I've got all the links on a pin post because I found people don't really go to files. Files sound great, but people like me that are too lazy don't go to the files. I like links. Click on every link you give me to get. So um, I have probably 13 different links on my Facebook group. Um, it links to the Deficit Assist Program, which there is one. So when people say I can't afford deficit, there's a program that they have that they can call them and they can counsel them about the deficit. They can offer them um, money to help them with their copay if they do have insurance, but their copay is high. And some people, like my mom, can get it for free, depending on I mean, if you're on Social Security or have different issues. Um, the resources are out there. Um, there's several links to um, pages that talk about the testing, because patients want to know about testing. Which test is most accurate? Well, I can only say what I've read. I can only say what I've experienced. So it's one of those things, just kind of, um, as best as you can, take any information that you've learned. Don't be a medical expert unless you are a medical expert. And talk about poop. If I can have any, if, if I can walk away from this with y'all learning anything, those are the two things. You're not a doctor unless you are. <laughs> and everybody poops. <laughs> I know, don't just say too much and there is no such thing. And I do have one more thing before I'm going to stop because I do get out of the wrong way. Um, another important thing that I have conveyed to C. diff patients that are going through a rough time is I have found very helpful my C. diff journals. And the C. diff journal is a book that you write down what you eat, what you drink, when you take your medications. I write down the times and I write down every single thing that's on there. Because then, since I'm a recur, I can go back and look at last year's journal and I go, oh, that's right, this is normal for me. Oh, that's right, that food didn't agree with me, why did I try that again? Had I not had that each time when I would come back, and I didn't start my journals until year five, so I have, this is my fourth year of journaling. So it's one of those, that has been one of the biggest benefits is the journal. So when you're out there, if someone's saying, how do I deal with this? Add that into it. So TMI, poop in a journal. <laughs> This is how I roll, just on the couch. So, <laughs> my notes are on the back of my J. Peterman catalog. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come at it from a little bit of a, a different angle. Um, I started Foundation going three years ago, and at first, my goal well, first thing I did was come up with a mission statement. Um, and it's very similar to you know, what we're all trying to accomplish, raise awareness, provide education, and advocate for patients uh, and for, for research and science in this area. So the first thing I wanted to do was build a website just where patients could go and get information. And, and eventually that evolved into information for physicians and um, links to other resources. Um, and of course, I had a contact page on there. And, and as you all probably now have, um, foundation email accounts, you're going to find that with your email address being on uh, the website probably, you're going to get emails from people. And, you know, 
still to this day, every email, we had over a million visits on the website last year, and every email comes to me. And I still feel the responsibility uh, to answer every email because I just remember feeling that there is nobody out there who knows what I'm going through. And uh, I, I haven't been able to let that go yet, although I'm, I'm working on it. And so the, the first point I want to make is just like those of you who, who fly or have flown, first couple of times you pay attention to what the steward, not steward, but I'm trying to age attendant is saying about if there's an emergency and the oxygen masks come down, that it's most important that you put your own on before you help someone else. And I think that that is maybe one of the most important aspects of being an advocate. You're gonna burn out and not be able to help anybody if you don't take care of yourself. So the most important thing you need to do is recognize when you reach the limit for that day or that topic or that subject or that area and step away. Um, none of us here can help every person. And we always have to keep the bigger picture in mind. What are we trying to do collectively? So that's the first thing I would say. Take care of yourself, know your limits, set your limits, respect your limits, and develop boundaries. Um, I think that, that people will ask you for medical advice. And I don't think we've addressed this here. Um, the reason you can't give medical advice is, especially um, as a 501c3, as Christian and I both are, um, we have legal boundaries. And we have um, exposure to legal liability. And if someone's representing are speaking on behalf of our foundation, crosses that line and actually gives medical advice that results in harm, then our foundations could be held liable. I mean, we both carry very expensive directors and um, officer liability insurance, but you don't want to have to ever use that. So um, the, the first thing I do in every conversation is say, I'm not a doctor. I'm a patient. I'm a grandma. I'll talk to you as long as you want to talk about whatever you want to talk about, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to tell you what you should do or what I, you know, I'll tell you what I did. Um, and I'll point you to other resources. So I preface almost every uh, electronic uh, conversation I have, whether it's a responding to a message on Facebook or an email, uh, I usually preface it by that or, you know, somewhere in the conversation. Also, um, have a disclaimer at the end of my email that was provided to, to me by uh, the law firm that represents us, saying that this email or electronic communication is not to be, you know, it's not for the intended recipient. You're not the intended recipient. It shouldn't be shared, forwarded. It should be deleted, not stored. Um, and I think that's a good idea if you're if you're engaging in electronic communication on behalf of a foundation or a group. Um, so you might want to look into that. There's examples of that all, all over the internet. Go to basically any, uh, well, just look at emails you receive from, from groups and they're, they're usually on there. Um, one of the most important things you'll do is know, know within this community uh, areas of interest that we each have and areas of specialty specialization so that you can refer people to the proper areas. I have only experienced what it's like for me to have C. diff. I've never been a caregiver of someone with C. diff. I've never had an elderly patient with C. diff. I've never had a child with C. diff. Um, so I have developed a, kind of a bank of volunteers you know, for my foundation, and I think we should all be aware of this within this group of knowing what areas we're each going to be comfortable in so that we can refer people to the proper person if it's not an area which we have expertise or feel comfortable talking with. And the same goes with area uh, resources outside of this group. You know, I frequently refer people to the CDC infographics or ask people to comment on the Federal Registry or send a, a comment to the FDA. 
and um, you need to learn how to do those things. It's not as simple as just sending an email and hit and send. You have to, it, it's a very formal process. It's not that huge, but if you want your comments to be read, you have to engage in their process. Um, collaboration. About a week after I spoke at the FDA the first time, I think it was Cliff McDonald at CDC called me and said, you need to talk to this guy named Kristen Lewis. <laughs> and we connected, I think, that day and, you know, immediately saw that we need to be working together. And we've been working together ever since. And um, even in the areas where you might not initially think that there's a, a good place for collaboration there, like people say to me, doesn't it drive you crazy that Lisa started an FMT failure page? No. It's not something I would do because I'm advocating for the science of fecal transplant. But I think it's important that people know, you know, everything about fecal transplant, good, bad, and all about, you know, I do address adverse risks. But um, so if you meet someone and it seems like you have opposing interests, there's always a common ground if you just take the time to go a little bit deeper with that person. And you can always find a, a place or a way that you can connect and, and work together. Whether it's, um, you know, I had some, some girlfriend take me out to lunch. She said, I want to hear more about the foundation. I was like, oh, great. Well, she wanted to sell me uh, some kind of makeup that people sell from home. But, you know, we started talking. I was like, oh, this is not what I thought. Um, but we started talking about, you know, my interest in kind of holistic medicine, more natural approaches, and this makeup line is based on on and, you know, no artificial ingredients, chemicals, additives, natural products. And so we realized that we really do have a shared interest. And, and we've kind of grown from there, and now we're both reaching out to each other's contacts on, in that shared area. So always look for, it might not be obvious, it might not be what you think you, you were going to have a conversation about, but be open to having a different conversation if that's what it takes to connect with someone. Um, because that's what this is all about. It's it's not, in this world, it's not so much what you know as who you know and who you can get in front of and who you can get the message out to. And that's how we're going to accomplish things together. This, this big web that we're going to form together. Um, you do have to be prepared for negativity. Um, as, as all of us who are very involved in social media now, there's a lot of drama sometimes. <laughs> it ebbs and flows, but people are, I would say, BS crazy. People are crazy. Some people are crazy. And you're going to have to deal with that. And, uh, you know, we talked about not, not letting a troll engage you and, and for people like me who are fairly recent to, you know, having Facebook groups and Twitter and Instagram and all that, um, all a troll wants to do is, is trying to bait you into saying something that you shouldn't. So, um, you know, I keep waiting for Twitter or Facebook or email, Gmail or my foundation email to develop a tool where you can retract something after you hit send or post, because I've wanted that a lot. Um, so now I kind of make a rule that I just, I write something and I don't post it yet. And I kind of let it stew for a little while. And nine times out of 10, I, I either delete it completely or I go back and edit the heck out of it. Um, so do that. Don't, don't post or comment or anything on the fly. Um, always try to measure what you're saying and how you want to say it and who you're trying to reach. Also, as far as social media, um, go on each of our Facebook website, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and see who we are following and see who we follow and grow your own network that way. And, and I'm going to do the same with people that I've connected with here today uh, and yesterday. Um, 
I'm going to see who, who they're connected with because I, I probably need to be following those people or hearing what those people say. And I also probably would like for those people to hear what I'm trying to say. So if, if this part of it, the text part of it, is uh, beyond you, just ask. Don't be afraid or ashamed or anything because, you know, we didn't grow up with computers. Uh, I got a computer in 1991 when I went back to graduate school, and I got a cell phone at the same time anymore because it's this big. <laughs> but I have three kids in their uh, 20s and 30s, and you know, I go to them. But if you don't have anybody that you, that you know, ask ask somebody here today. Um, but it's important to develop those social networks and be prepared for the drama. Don't engage with people unnecessarily if it's not going to be productive. Learn to recognize that and don't burn yourself out. Take care of yourself and remember that remember the bigger picture and what we're trying to do here as a group. Too. Um, a big part of what I do is create an illusion of safeness. Um, I project um, positivity and I try to focus people away from the illness when they're in the freak out mode. I do what I call talking them off the ledge. And all that entails is listening to them and just kind of, you know, telling them it's going to be all right and focusing them away. And so, do you have a lake in your yard? Do you find something to distract them? Um, because I think, I, I wanted to say that, I forgot about it, but I think that's something that's helpful too, is focus on the positive and try to get people out of you know, the whole seated thing for a minute and a half. Because a lot of times when you're a seated patient, it's easy to get sucked in and hyper focus on seated. Every waking moment becomes seated for a seated patient, especially if they've recurred. And so that's why it's important to, to try to focus away from C. diff occasionally, even if you're in a group about C. diff or you're doing whatever about C. diff occasionally, it's good to take those people and bring them somewhere they're familiar with. You know, go, oh, do you have kids? Do you have pets? Do you have a hamster? Anything to distract them. I mean, I, I've done it. I've, I've, I've tried to dig and find things to get people off that ledge because I'm telling you, their freak out moments are very real to them. And we know that, okay, you, you might be on your first bout of C. diff, and this might be your first round of medication, and you can't eat, and you're two days into it. Hang on. You know, it's not time to freak out. There's a, there's a couple times you might want to freak out, but then you got to freak out and move on. So just really, I just wanted to put that in there to focus on the positive and, and bring them to a good place whenever you can, because that's why they're reaching out to us as advocates. They want advice, they want information, and they just want to be heard. <laughs> Oh, um, <laughs> uh, you can visit our website. <laughs> um, so, uh, actually, uh, quite just Laura, do you want to maybe bring it up and we can just show? So, <clears throat> um, so in starting Advocates Council, one of the things that that we did um, is on our new web page we have what they would call in your state, um, and so we'll all bring that up and. Basically, it's a map of the United States, and you can either do a poll down or click on it. Um, and as we have advocates in each state, um, part of being an advocate means that you make yourself, you know, within reason, available um, to respond to people who reach out to you with questions. Um, you know, at least I've already gotten a few questions through the through the that email address. Um, if you don't want to share your personal email address, we give you a pink foundation.org email address. Um, we certainly don't want people, you know, to, I mean, there was a point where, there was a point where my cell phone number was on our old website, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, and, I mean, I don't have a landline, so 
they can't find me that way. Um, but so yeah, so I mean that's that's uh, something that folks can do. And then you know, I'm uh, in terms of other folks that have been here and the presenters, whether it's you know Helen or Lisa, you know Eileen, you're going to hear from in a little while. Like we have lists of partner organizations on the website that do similar work to us. Um, we probably will eventually build. Um, the state, uh, the annual state page to include statewide patient safety and advocacy organizations. Um, we just didn't get to do that consideration. I was actually getting all the way over there. Um, Sorry. Like, Sorry. That's not going to work. Um, I don't like your new, I don't like the new Windows thing. I don't like that Windows thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very complicated. You ruin out the Windows. <laughs> um, so I guess, well, let me get, I mean, I'll just say a couple words about it, and then maybe um, you can take a break and then have I mean a little early if you're, if you're game. Um, I don't know. It might still be late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You want to say like, please? Oh, maybe, I'm sorry. All right, well, maybe we'll go right to Eileen. So the other thing, I, mean, I don't think you guys touched on this, but um, and it relates to Brian's so, stuff. I mean, so we've had one or two instances where we had people who became involved with the foundation who had a SIBA, right? And it became clear uh, in one case very quickly, and then in another case over time that the person was toxic. Toxic to our efforts, toxic to my mental health. Um, and so you have to, I think, be willing to draw boundaries and barriers. Um, and because this person had C. diff and my mother died of C. diff, and our mission is to raise awareness and advocate for people with C. diff, I probably kept this person in our life and as part of our organization for about 18 months longer than I ever would have tolerated this behavior from any other human being in any other circumstance. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's no, it's not, it's not, it's not what we said it was. Um, yeah, and that's tough because the other repercussions of that are potentially will this person who in many ways is an internet troll, I think is how I can say this one, are they gonna go on to cdiffdiscuss.org and say, Christian sent me this email saying he didn't want me involved with them anymore. You know, so you have to kind of be strategic if you're at that point because, you know, uh, the other thing when it comes to online stuff, like now that we, you know, we've met most of you in person, but like, um, and I think it depends on sort of the nature of the relationship, but like, people who come to us and say, I have C. diff, and I have, like, we're taking your word for it. <laughs> like, we don't know. Like, we, you know, I don't have to, I mean, this not, that's not to doubt anyone in this room, I'm not saying that, but like, you could potentially be being engaged by somebody who's really just there to play games. It may not be obvious at first. They may have a, another agenda. Um, so I don't know. I'll just leave you with this little story, which was the most baffling story of my entire life in working in CDF. So, um, Catherine and I were both part of not that long ago a CDC teleconference call presenting this new research and different things. And so, a couple weeks after that, um, I get an email from CDC, like from the people at CDC saying, This person contacted us and wanted your. Uh, and they won't give it out. If you're involved with CDC, like they will not give anyone my phone number or my email. Like they respect your, but of course we would never do that either. Um, what they will do is they will forward a message to us saying this person would like you to contact them. So now imagine we're planning this thing. This is only a few weeks ago. Um, and so I'm like, oh, like two days ago, I'm like, oh, you have to call that guy. I'm like, you must be curious. You must want to get involved. You must be an advocate. Um, so I finally call him. And we're talking, and he's like, I'm going to start this uncle, and this, that, and the other thing. And he starts consumer, and he also called consumer reports. He also called the woman who wrote the article, the, the Superbugs article on consumer reports. Um, so we're on the phone, we're talking, we're talking, um, and he's telling me how, how beautiful the picture of us with our mother is, and the picture of us in the front stoop, et cetera, et cetera. My hands laughing because I called him. I was stunned. I'm, I'm very rarely rendered speechless that I was rendered speechless by this. <clears throat> and so then I say, so, so you know, how can I help you? Like, what can we do for you? Like, I, you know, I really want to kind of get to like the part where we can help you. Um, and he says, so my friend paints portraits, and he's not good at marketing, so I do the marketing for him. 
And I'm thinking it would be great if we had, if you and your brother had a painted portrait of you and your mother, like in that picture. I mean, <laughs> he, con he contacted the Centers for Disease Control. I mean, I I was like, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> You know, but the other thing I think Catherine touched on this too is, you know, I, you become aware, and especially like the, the USA Today cover story was part of it, the Consumer Reports and I think it's even bigger, but you become aware that at some point you are, you are becoming a public figure in some way. You know, I mean, the reality is like Kim Kardashian is a public figure. Someone can explain that to me someday, but like, not to that extent, but in some ways, and I think like Helen and I, Eileen, those who have been doing this and been in the public world, like, that call actually made me aware of how public we are now. You know what I'm saying? Like, this guy somehow saw Consumer Reports and decided to try to sell me something. So, so I would just leave, you know, so that's where we give you a peggyfoundation.org email. <laughs> you know, like, um, so yeah, um, I think sure. that's, so. What, what is, I mean, I, I know what I was talking to you, but what is, what's the lesson in that? Because it's not unusual. Yeah, I mean, so the lesson in that for me, um, I don't know what the lesson in that for me is actually, to be honest with you. Um, I, I talked earlier about the need to modulate. Um, and so like when I called him back, I called him back as the executive director of the Peggy Bowles Foundation, not as Christian John Mullis, you know, personal person who deals with like a U-Haul thing or whatever. Um, and so I just, you know, I basically, as politely as I could get off the phone, um, he's since called me again because when I called him, got my cell phone number. Um, so I think that means a block cell phone number in the future. Um, and I, you know, I really don't know what to say. I'm not. I'm not going to engage him further. I don't. I'm not going to say anything. I mean, I'm telling you guys. Apparently, the internet. Um, <laughs> 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 like I would never say his name or anything. It's just. It's just. I think it's the lesson for all of us. I, I asked that question within the first few minutes. Yeah. Why you're calling. Like, and, you know, I actually did say, I said, oh, I said, you know, I, I heard you heard it was from Consumer Reports, so, you know, uh, and so, you know, I did, I, I, I didn't say, like, how can I help you? I said something else, like, so, you know, how are you or what did you want to discuss? And, like, because I thought, you know, but I think you're right that I could have cut to the chase sooner. Um, but I also, and I think you guys touched on this, like, when somebody, like, he was telling this story and it was about his uncle in a car accident, and I'm thinking any minute I was going to be like, and then my uncle got C. diff. And, you know, there was no C. diff ever involved. And at any point, the man did never hear a C. diff until he saw a picture in consumer reports. But I think the difficulty there is, like, I would not want to turn somebody away who genuinely needed us. You know, um, so that was tricky. But you know, I'll, I I wouldn't rush. I did tell CDC. I did write her back and say, like, in the future, you may want to ask why people want to contact people. You know, but of course, they're the like, you know, they don't have time to like be grilling everybody. Um, so, anybody else have any other questions, or should we switch over to Eileen? All right. Uh, I would just say that speaking about vulnerability, vulnerability has another side of itself. Vulnerability is an important part of our stories. It's a part of the Velcro that makes us attractive to policymakers, but vulnerability has another side. And that part of the beauty of activism, part of the beauty of good advocate, is being tough at the same time as you're tender. Mm -hmm. And being able to protect the tenderness with the requisite degree of toughness so that your vulnerability is preserved. And that Catherine's challenge to all of us to be good to ourselves Preserving our ability to be advocates is a challenge that we are each mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it.